This is November 1994, and we're in Dayton, Ohio, and we are speaking to a liberator of one of the concentration camps from World War II during the Holocaust. And next spring will be the 50th anniversary of that liberation. And we are listening to the testimony of someone who was there, Mr. Donald Key, Union City, Indiana. Yes, my name is Donald Key, pronounced just like it's spelled, K-E-Y, Key. Been mispronounced so many ways, you wouldn't believe that people could mess it up quite like that. I was born in Union City, Ohio, and under a year old, I was moved to Union City, Indiana with my parents, and I've been a lifelong resident of Union City, Indiana. At what point did you go into the Army? I went into the Army in 1942. It was recommended that, almost uh, demanded, that upon graduation from high school, you go right down to the draft board and register for the draft. I uh, graduated in June 1942, married my childhood sweetheart, Dakota, in uh, July 1942, and was drafted into the military service in December that same year. It was a year. And then, then you were in, in what unit, and, and, um, and you went to where to, for your basic training? I was drafted into uh, the Third Army. No, the First Army. I was drafted into the First Army originally and uh, took our basic training in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia and uh, Camp Sutton, North, Car uh, North Carolina in uh, 1943 under the Second Army. And that's when you had this uniform that, that we... That's, no, the uniform uh, wasn't came. issued until later. Until later. Uh, in 1943 before we were shipped overseas. I see. We were in a training uniform up until that time, and uh, the training form, and training uniform was not the overseas uniform, and uh, the training uniform was uh, had the Second Army patch on it. I see. And we were transferred into the Third Army unit and we were sent overseas, still in the Second Army, but we were transferred from uh, the Second Army into the George Patton's Third Army while we were in advanced training in England. I see. You went into advanced training in England, and then where did you go from there? Uh, we uh, had our ranger training there in the southern part of England in a little community called Hereford, where we were trained for the assault troops on the French coast. And we were into the uh, French coast with the assault troops landing at uh, Utah Beach on the Normandy Peninsula. So you were part of that? Invasion. We were part of the invasion force, yes. Um, as you moved across Europe, had you heard anything about concentration camps or people? No, we were aware that there were uh, various camps, DP camps, also uh, prisoner of war camps. But uh, the uh, concentration camps, or what we called death camps, were a complete secret. We had no idea until the day that we walked into their gates. And when was that that you came upon? That was in the spring of uh, uh, 45. Previous to that, uh, going across the uh, country of France with George H. Patton's uh, armored columns, it was leapfrogging just almost continually all the way, very slow at first through the uh, small fields in the uh, hedgerow country. But then as we went across France, we were leapfrogging in with the, behind the uh, uh, armored columns, as the armored columns would obtain their objectives and uh, service troops to the rear were moved up into those groups. And uh, we were in uh, Nancy, France, preparing to cross the Rhine River there and get into the German countryside when the Germans pulled their counteroffensive up into the uh, Belgium area and we were transferred up to the Bastogne area for the relief of the troops that were uh, surrounded there in the Bastogne area. And after that, 
conflict. Then we went right down the Rhine River uh, with the crossing at uh, Remagen Bridge and then on south uh, along the Rhine River to the Wiesbaden, Frankfurt area. And uh, still following George Patton's uh, armored columns in their assault where they would uh, surround large amounts of land and large amounts of German troops. And as they were surrounded, then the uh, German troops surrendered in very large numbers. Sometimes brigade uh, and lots of uh, several hundred and sometimes even thousands. And in one place, they, a whole army had uh, been surrounded and uh, surrendered. So as you were moving, suddenly you happened upon this place called Buchenwald? Yes. I was a messenger in the um, uh, Third Army Service and was on the road almost continually from our Army headquarters to our group headquarters and our uh, corps headquarters and back to my own company. So you moved and, ahead uh, a little bit of yes. your troops? Um, very seldom into the forward armored column troops, but once in a while into the armored column troops. We pretty much knew what was coming and what was going, but uh, still the order was sealed, and I had no inkling of ever coming across these camps. I think the first camp that we saw was a, um, a prisoner of war camp where a bunch of um, American and uh, British airmen had uh, been interned. And of course, they were in much better shape than what the, uh, we found the political prisoners and the uh, other uh, DPs and uh, prisoners of the Germans in these death camps. I believe the death camps were sent there, were established just for that reason, just uh, cause death of right. large groups. So, so tell us what, what happened when you came into Buchenwald. Well, this particular morning was after another one of uh, George Patton's forward assault groups. Their objective had been reached on the far side of the camp. And as we were ordered to move forward, there was this camp and uh, the big wooden gates and... Do uh, you remember the date? No, I don't. Approximately. It was in it, it was April. It was in the spring yeah. of uh, that year. Still cold and we wondered just why those people didn't freeze to death because we were clad in our heavy jackets yet and uh, winter had just was over and it was cold but still these people uh, had very little clothing if any at all and most of them were barefooted but still they some of them were still hanging on life when you walked in what what did you see what what did well we were warned at the gate by combat mps that had been following the uh, main assault troops that it was not a pretty sight. And that was just putting it mildly. Right. But they said, uh, do not take any food in and do not take any weapons except sidearms. And uh, so these were all kept on outside the gate. Myself, I had a sidearm and uh, I, I wore it into the compound but they were afraid that the sight of um, military men in full armor and full arms uh, might uh, cause some bad feelings and some even trouble sure. within the camp. So we were warned and uh, also warned not to give them any food at all because these people had starved and their bodies just wouldn't take even. They would get very, very sick if yes. they ate. And most of us always carried a bar of candy or two for the uh, sure. French children and German children as we'd come by them. Sure. And uh, Americans are soft that way. They're very sentimental people. And um, it was really all that we could take when we got into the camp to see what it was. And. Uh, you have pictures you took? Yes, we, I, I had a $2 box camera that had been a graduation present just a few months before. And uh, somehow I was still able to keep that. And I don't think at the time maybe I still had a half a roll of film, or I'd have probably taken every picture that I could possibly take. But I took uh, a few pictures that uh, 
I thought, well, it'd be something I could show the folks at home when I got back because um, they had no idea just what they were sending us into. And uh, it was bad enough to uh, see death on the battlefield, even when the enemy was shooting at us. Mm. But to go and see death on this grand scale, it was um, just uh, a terrible thing. Mm. And terrible is a mild word. Were you there for hours or for long? Just hours. Hours. Our, our unit was continually on the move to back up the uh, troops, uh, the assault troops that are ahead of us, the armored columns and the uh, mechanized infantry columns that had gone ahead. You saw piles of bodies or, or live people, were there men, women, or children? Do you remember? The bodies we saw were dead people, dead and dying. Uh, the bodies were stripped Yes, that's the uh, camp main entrance, uh, and I took those pictures. Uh, this wagon load of bodies here is at the crematorium or the uh, furnaces where the uh, bodies were born, uh, were uh, burnt and destroyed. And some of these bodies, even on this wagon, uh, are possibly still alive because the body just no longer moves. Uh, outwardly and in, in appearance, uh, they were still looted on this by other prisoners. And this is the outside of the crematorium picture. This picture is of a, another wagon just about like it with my uh, commanding officer and his uh, platoon leaders in the background there and the uh, our staff sergeant uh, with his back towards you there and the uh, with a clipboard. This picture is another group of uh, prisoners that were the burial detail uh, getting some of the streets cleaned up. Now this was probably the last picture that I took at this camp because um, up until this time, this late forenoon of this first day, the uh, everybody was just standing around. Now their payment for, or their... Um, Were there still German guards or, I mean, have no guards, nobody, no. any, just, just the prisoners they, at that they had point? They had escaped a... out the back, as, mm -hmm. as I was told by one of the prisoners that I had talked to, that they had escaped when the uh, Americans approached the gate. Sure. So they went out the back gate a lot faster than we went in the front. But this, this burial detail went into effect after we left. This is another picture of another wagon that there at the uh, crematorium. It must have been very difficult for you as a young man to, to view things like that and imagine. It, it certainly was. It was. It was a hard thing for us to even in stomach because uh, the uh, filth and the scurfy and the dysentery and the open sores and uh, I have heard that there even had been some cannibalism in this uh, camp but uh, I never had anybody to uh, admit it or say that they saw any cannibalism. But it wouldn't be hard to imagine that anything happened in a place that was that horrible. Well that's right. Uh, some of the prisoners, uh, here you see prisoners that look like they're uh, able-bodied men. But their payment for doing these duties that they're doing was just a crust of bread. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was bribery. The, uh, a man would do anything for a crust of bread if he's starving or to death. Or stay and, alive uh, for a short time. Yes. This camp is also... Uh, one of the camps that were f was famous for a lot of uh, experimentation on human bodies. And uh, one of the pictures that I tried to get that I didn't get was a picture of, uh, that was taken of lampshades and uh, paraphernalia 
that was bailed because a woman, possibly a wife of one of the commandants, had uh, taken an interest in tattoos and uh, bodies were even murdered for a tattoo that might be on the person's back or on his arm and uh, displayed as lampshades or novelty items. But that picture, uh, I must have run out of film bug before I got that. It was hard for troops moving forward continually to even get their pictures developed after we got them. But, but these pictures were developed in a small uh, community, a small village there in Germany. And uh, the German that uh, developed the pictures for me said he had no idea that such a thing was going on. When you came home, did you talk about what had happened, or did you take it in well, the side? Like most veterans, I uh, left that part of my life just fade away. I woke up in nightmares uh, several times. Uh, my wife would uh, get me up and we'd walk around a little bit and maybe drink a cup of coffee or a cup of hot chocolate or something. And uh, it was bad. The uh, trips through the barracks themselves were uh, something that we were asked to do, but we were not told to do it. And uh, one of the barracks we walked through, possibly a hundred uh, feet long, uh, 60 or 70 feet wide, contained hundreds and hundreds of bunks, some four high in the room, some five high in the room, and with uh, live and dead bodies just side by side, just as close as they could be stacked in there, without any blankets, uh, some with an extra coat, some without a coat, some with no clothes at all because they had already died and they were stripped of their clothing by other prisoners trying to keep warm. And as I walked through the aisle between the uh, bunks, there's a man said, hello. And uh, I was quite surprised to hear a prisoner speaking the German language, the plane. And uh, I said, hello. And uh, he said, it's so nice to see you. And uh, I said, you speak beautiful English and uh, very plain. And he said, yes, I speak seven languages. He was a German professor that had spoken out against the, uh, in school. And he was a German nationalist. But still, he was a prisoner of war because he was in there suffering the same fate that the others in the death camp had come to suffer just because he had spoken out. And uh, I loved, lost touch with this man. I wish I'd have got his name, and I wish I'd have uh, kept a relationship with him, but I didn't. Uh, he was an older man than I was myself. I was just turned uh, 22 years old, and uh, he was possibly in his uh, late uh, 20s, early 30s but still looked like uh, a man of uh, 50 or 60 or maybe even 70 because the teeth was rotten and uh, he had just been put out of a way and forgotten. And sooner or later he would have been eliminated along with the rest of them. Has, has this experience that after you got home, has it affected your life? Oh yes, yes. I have a daughter that is a Hebrew student. She lives here in Dayton. And uh, she's been back home to the homeland uh, uh, the third time, plans to go again in 1995. And uh, we uh, subscribe to several uh, Jewish publications because uh, they are people that we have fallen in love with, great people. Well, you're obviously a humanitarian, and we, we in this country owe you a debt of gratitude. And um, we know it's difficult for you to recall these times, but for the sake of history, um, we have to. It must never happen again.
Thank you, Mr. Kitty. My pleasure.